Hello, welcome to News Click and People's Dispatch. Um, it's a real treat today because I'm with Probir Purkaista, not only the editor in chief of News Click, but of course the founder of News Click, and somebody that I well remember um, being interviewed by from 2009 onwards. So it's a treat here, Probir, to turn the tables on you and um, get the chance to grill you. So welcome to News Click and People's Dispatch. Well, you know, Vijay, I still remember the, the times that we used to sit in that little basement of ours. And I was just recounting to a friend of mine that Ajaz was also used to be there. And how once you, you had interviewed Ajaz over there, remember? Yes, and, of course. Uh, so yes, we really do go back a long way. And of course, you were my one of my key guests always for international issues. What fun we had in that little apartment, basement apartment. Well, Probeet comes to us now with a book, which I think is a landmark work, um, you know, on science, on technology, on the question of knowledge in general. The book is called Knowledge as Commons Towards Inclusive Science and Technology. Just out from leftward books, if I may say so, it's not only a very quick and informative read, but it's it reads a lot like things that Probeer has been thinking about for the bulk of his professional and intellectual life. It's almost like a summary of a great deal of, of thought. Uh, Probeer, I wanted to start by asking you um, a little bit about the two key terms in the title, science and technology. At the front of the book, you make a very important point that well, technology is sometimes set aside and science is given priority. That might have to do with the class system of knowledge. You believe, in fact, that these are not such distinct uh, arenas. They are different, but they're not so distinct. In fact, you say at one point, could there be a third word that encapsulates the two? Could you talk a little bit about science, technology, and perhaps this third word that encapsulates the two? Well, you know, one starting point of both science and technology is that it is, after all, sphere of knowledge that both come from. One produces theories, the other produces artifacts which we use. Artifacts may be even today in terms of software. They're not necessarily physically tangible artifacts, but nevertheless, software is also an artifact. So there are different kinds of knowledge and to think that one is knowledge, other is somehow applied, is the fundamental distinction that I wanted to make, that technology is not just application of knowledge, but it's a different kind of knowledge, just as science also uses instruments, but it is not the product of the instruments alone. It's a product of the knowledge that you create through the instruments, therefore the link, of course, but also the fact that they are separate kinds of activities and therefore that knowledge can be both technological, can be scientific, can be theoretical, can be practical, but all of it is hinging on the purpose that you have for the knowledge. Do you build theories to understand nature or do you build artifacts to change nature? And I think that's a very fundamental point. In fact, Kosambi, talks about it, uh, and that's the inscription I think I've used in the book as well, that this, I think, is very fundamental. To me, the reason that we have privileged knowledge, scientific knowledge, theoretical knowledge, as people would like to say, over the application, the applied science that they used to term it as, which is where my discomfort really lies from, is the fact that we privilege, as you have said, the head over the hat. And we forget that what makes us human is the fact that when you stand up, we have the opposable thumb and we have the ability to make tools. As the anthropologists would say, human beings are tool making animals. And that's what distinguishes from others. It's not the head, but it is really the hands. And I think that was a very, very, uh, shall we say, a important point in my life because I realized that I actually wanted to be an engineer and I wasn't a scientist and it's a different profession that I was in. 
And that, that has taken a long time to work out these views, as you said. It's really a lifetime exercise of doing things, looking at all of this, and then at various points of time, putting it down. In fact, one of the essays is really originally written about 35 years back. And when I read it again, I see, okay, I was on the right track even then, trying to distinguish between the same. But I, of course, have much more experience, as you said, of a practicing engineer, looking at all of this. And therefore, the book really tries to flesh out this journey. You know, the book bristles with examples. You, you have a range of examples that are important uh, for the reader who may not really have an understanding of the history of science and technology. You know, uh, it's one thing to pick up an iPhone and fiddle about with it. It's another to know about how or where we got to this point of being able to have powerful computer at our, you know, in, in those caught between the opposable thumb and the rest of our fingers. Seems like often we're trapped, right, Probe, with this device in our hands, little understanding of its history. I mean, your text, your book, uh, Knowledge is Commons, is so erudite. It's filled with examples, giving people a crash course in the history of science and technology. On the other hand, the term science and the term technology have this tendency to be seen as, let's say, transhistorical, as if science from the beginning of time, you know, when humans stood up, to borrow from you, uh, when humans stood up, there was science and there's science now. When humans stood up, there's technology, the use of tools maybe, uh, and there's the use of tools now. However, science and technology are not transhistorical. They are rooted in um, the systems of production that we have. They're rooted, in fact, as you go on at length in a society in which they are developed. Can you talk a little bit about science and technology rooted in time, rooted in space, rooted in, in the, say, the forms of production um, in which people live? You know, well, this is, the answer would actually need the reading of the book and a couple of more books uh, that you probably also have to write. So I'm not going to give an easy answer uh, to this question. But, you know, if I look at how ancient societies, for example, and I'm very well talking about ancient societies, we're really talking about Homo sapiens emerging and what distinguishes them from others. And then trying to reflect is it something which is just prehistoric, just an incidental issue, or is it something still continues today between knowing and the artifact? And this is the exercise that I have tried to do. And then when we look at also the other absence that is there, you see, historians have written about history. So we know the historical systems that existed. We know about economic systems that existed. Scientists actually do write about the nature of their discipline. And in fact, at one point of time, they wrote more because they had a formal discipline. In the discipline itself, they also had to study philosophy how to locate science in the larger system of knowledge. Technologists, unfortunately, lack that. In fact, unless you take the French systems of the polytechnics, which really did combine to uh, have, uh, combined doing with thinking. But if you take the British systems, which we unfortunately inherit much more, their technology was not even recognized as something the gentlemen should do. In fact, it was, uh, they were not allowed into clubs, for example. You know, they're clubbed with tradespeople. In fact, that's one of the reasons that engineers and technologists after the 50s and 60s don't grow in UK. In fact, they then, if you want to go up in life, you don't come from the landed aristocracy, you don't come from Oxford and Cambridge, then what you do is you do finance and law, but you don't do engineering which is not true for many other countries. And of course, we in India, as you know, inherit the caste system. So the hand is always something to be looked down upon. So the sociology of the technologists and the sociology of scientists are relatively different in terms how they perceive themselves. And unfortunately, the problem that I think most technologists have 
that we write boring things called specifications and reports, but we don't write about the nature of our discipline, unlike the scientific community, which actually does, at least a set of them do. So this is one big gap that we don't really think about the nature of what we do. And to some extent, this still persists today. So you've got a lot of misconceptions, two sets of misconceptions I will take up. One is that the, it is an adjusted applied science. The theory, you apply it, you get artifacts, and it doesn't work. Because unless you know what you want to make, the what theory I use is not, it doesn't come naturally. Just because of a theory, the artifact does not derive from it. The artifact generally derives from a specific social need. And that is the fundamental difference that we have. That society, social need is embedded in any artifact that you want to do. That is its function. Now, what I also have thought about, and I, that's what I've written, that quite often science is not the principle that we use to achieve that. It's quite often a constraint. What I can't do tells me what is it that can't be done. It sets limits. But what I do depends on what exactly the social need is or the physical need is. So this is a reflection, shall I say, of an engineer about the nature of his discipline. And I'm sure a lot of engineers, if you ask them, will say the same thing. Technologists will say the same thing. But as I said, unfortunately, they'll say it, but they won't write it. Or very few people have. So this is one of the problems that is there, why we tend to get subsumed. And now there is this talk about techno science and that everything is merged together. The point is, when you say, put a telescope, which you have done today, the most powerful telescopes that is circling the earth, looking at the, you know, really the farthest reaches of space, it's a technological marvel. It really is. When you talk about, say, the chip manufacturing machine, it's a technological marvel. But there is an objective to it, that this is what you want. It's still an artifact. It's still very much like this. Okay, <laughs> The origin lies here. So when you talk about these things, the objective is what is important in technology. And of course, that is conditioned by society. It is conditioned by who gives you the money who controls the product, who controls the production. And of course, it's deeply embedded in the class relations. And I think that is one part of it of the book. The second part of the book is that science and technology quite often is seen as if science advances and therefore technology you know, also advances. And I've said, take the major advances that we obviously can think of, the telescope. Now, telescope came from grinding of lines, uh, lenses, and that was a, a really artisanal work. There are no telescopes Galileo could buy. Don't, don't be manufacturing them. He had to do it himself. So a lot of this, for instance, in England, Hooke, he was a great technologist come scientist because scientists did not have somebody making these instruments for them at that stage. So all of this, when you look at, then you realize that it still continues today. In fact, one of the biggest surprises I had when I was reading about, uh, at that time, my passion, quantum mechanics, you know, the quantum world, really. One of the things I discovered, a paragraph in some book which said, you know, the main reason that we got of the, looked at radioactivity and all these issues, because first time the engineers, technologists could make a decent vacuum pump. And why did you make the vacuum pump? Because of the lamps, the incandescent lamps, which were then being made by Swan in England and Edison in the US, which needed vacuum, okay? And that suddenly lays bare the whole subatomical, subatomic particles regime from Marie Curie to all the, you know, all the other uh, people, Drongen, all of that. So it was really vacuum pumps, something which is very, small apparently in technology terms becomes a major break in science. And similarly, we can find enough reverse examples as well. And as I said, the social framing of all of this, privileging knowledge of science, nature over the artisanal work of the hand, these all of this, these things 
uh, things that I wanted to explore in this book. And finally, who owns all of this? Who owns the knowledge? And that is fundamentally then deals with who holds power in society and who does it. And I think that's something that is very important. For me, the other issue, of course, has been the class system. I have been on the factory floor. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, if you don't know English, you can't read the drawings in India. And if you can't read the drawings, then you are supposed to be an unskilled worker. So automatically, the caste system very much replicates itself even on the factory floor. But those who are, don't, do not have English education, even up to say class eight or something, they are not, they cannot be skilled workers because they cannot read instructions, they cannot read dry, drawings. And therefore, they are only going to be unskilled workers. Well, they are the ones who have for centuries have had the manual skills, who know how to do things with their hands, but they are not the ones who are important. So all of this societal issues as well, you know, it's so much a part of the life that I've lived in from the factory floor to what I did in practice. So I think I thought that it is important that I put it down because this is something which is, apart from my politics, which of course is very much there, apart from politics, these are also things that need to be brought in. And I end up with, of course, knowledge as commons, as the overriding political philosophy that we have to fight for, because otherwise it is enclosures of knowledge and creating monopolies because of these enclosures that we need to fight today. Coming back to who builds things, Prabir, who built the Vikram lander, who built the rocket that India has now sent up uh, to study the sun. Uh, Chandrayaan-3, quite an interesting development. One of the most stimulating essays in the book, Knowledge as Commons, is on the role of the left in science in India. I found that fascinating. I didn't know um, really any of that history. Could you reflect a little bit based on the understanding you have of the role of the left in the history of Indian science and technology um, with these quite amazing, almost startling things that seem to be happening at such, you know, I don't want to say low prices, but it is extraordinary what the Indian, um, you know, space research organization is able to do with the kind of resources that it, it has, uh, both with Chandrayaan-3 and now this rocket to the sun. But but long, long arc of history, as you, <laughs> what you say. One part of it is to look at that if you do not indigenize technology, in this case, really technology, then of course the costs are very high. And because India faced sanctions, uh, as you know, space and atomic energy were the two which were sanctioned uh, from the beginning. And therefore, it was something we had to develop by ourselves. Initially, we had a little bit of help here and there, for a long time, none. And of course, then we did get help for, from the Soviet Union at one point of time, and then Russia as well. So those things are very much there, which goes into making of this. But we were forced to do all of it ourselves, both in nuclear as well as the space sector, because of the US sanctions and what becomes as you know, uh, there was the regime which was introduced for uh, controlling technology flows. And if you were not with the United States and the Western powers, then you were frozen out of it, particularly if you wanted to make either uh, do nuclear reactors or you wanted to uh, do even what would be called nuclear fuel separation or you did rockets because those were supposed to be the preserve, the technology was to be preserved of the West. Now, in that, this is, I think, called the COCOM regime, which was there for, uh, for controlling technology. Now, this is something which was a huge uh, difficulty for us when the, uh, for the Pokhran blast in 1974, when uh, we get into the sanctions that the, the Western countries impose on us. And uh, then we did have to do a whole range of things all by ourselves. And that is where there is this completely unwritten history of the Bhava Atomic Research Center, the BRC, which pioneered a lot of these technologies, which have then 
flown into the industry in different ways, either through people or otherwise. Most important of the ones that I, of course, was uh, loosely associated, not with the nuclear energy program, but with the ECIL, which was the one manufacturing a lot of this stuff, is that ECIL was set up primarily by Atomic Energy Commission because they realized they need instruments and control systems for the nuclear reactor and for which they could now not get access to Western technology. Soviets also were reluctant to give technology, but they're a little more forthcoming than what the, the Western powers are doing. Uh, but we wanted to indigenize this. We also indigenized a lot of the metallurgy, special materials, all of that came out of the BRC and that flowed to the industry. I do remember that one of my friends was involved with what would be called stainless tube uh, welding, which was required for the heavy water project, which I've also touched in in my book. And that again, was something we had to develop indigenously because Montreal engineering had pulled out. Uh, the Kandu reactor is what we're building. And with those heavy water uh, plants required heat exchanges of st with stainless steel material. So all that in history is forgotten. Now the question is who were the ones who set these things up? And there, the issue, for instance, you take a Baba. Now people don't realize Baba in the student days was very much a part of the student movement in England. And he was, in fact, we checked up, I checked up, he did attend the founding of the World uh, Scientific Workers Association. He was, the two people who found, attended was, one is Baba, one is Meghnath Saha. Okay, then, of course, once he joined the atomic energy stuff, I think he kept out of all the politics and uh, then really did not go further on that. But he, as a student activist, seemed to have been a part of the, what would be called the World Student Federation and so on. So this is anecdotal uh, information that I have on this as well, but I'm not getting into that. But Saha, for instance, was public. He was very close to the left. He stood on the Communist Party ticket in Bengal as an independent. He, I did, he was one of the people who talked about self-reliance, was a part of the pushing uh, Bose, Subhash Chandra Bose for planning commission, planning committee, which is what he wanted to set up, talked about planning, how science and technology have to be planned for in an independent India. Then you have the whole bunch of people who are involved with medicines, for example. And uh, Sahib Singh Soke, who was a, in the British India Army, but he was a doctor, he was very close to the left again. It's very strange that you could have a military army officer being so close to the head, or so close to the left. But he was also a, basically a doctor. So he's the ones who set up the Hafkin, uh, really modernized the Hafkin Institute to produce in those days vaccines against cholera as well as smallpox. And his task was to really make it a mass production center, not just as a research center. That history is now virtually gone out of the Hafkin Institute. But Sahib Singh Soke becomes very important because he was a part of India's planning committee on medicine and he was anti-patent and he identified himself clearly with the left. And he was a voice which said, we have to reform our patent law. It took 20 more years before we successfully did that. And that become the 71 uh, planning uh, patent uh, act really, the, the way which is the basis for the Indian pharmaceutical system to emerge. But a lot of the scientific community, which we know, uh, which we know had a very important role, we did not know their links to the left till I, in one of the early conferences that Amit and others like Dinesh and I had organized. And in that, we found from J.S. Majumdar, who was uh, one of the unions, which was in the pharmaceutical industry and the medical rep representatives. So he talked about Sahib Singh Soke and that whole history. And then I went back and looked at it. And I said, my God, we never have really written these histories for ourselves. And I touched upon this in the Amit book, but I also thought that that history we need to recover. And let's not forget that history is not an isolated history of ours. It also comes from what was the larger left movement among the scientific community in the world. We have after all, at that point of time, apart from the nuclear bomb, which of course 
set a whole bunch of scientists against the bomb. But we also had the Scientific Work Association, which came out. And from Bernal to, you know, uh, Giulio Curie uh, in France, it's a very important names that were there. They're all considered a part of the left. And let's not forget, we have Holday, who uh, essentially uh, became an Indian citizen. And uh, we have the, the seven volumes history of China, which is again written by uh, a person who was very close to Needham, who goes to uh, China and really writes what would be the, the most authoritative text about Chinese uh, uh, science and technology history, of course, with Chinese colleagues. They are all considered, of, considered themselves to be a part of the left and fought against what at that time were the right-wing policies which were there. Unfortunately, we thought, or Bernal thought, that when he said science cannot be planned by capitalists, and that's why socialism will have, will have an edge, well, the capitalists proved to be more intelligent than, than that. They adopted Bernal's theories, his policies, and they planned the science, particularly after, as you know, discovering that the nuclear bomb needed planning in order to develop it because it was going to be uh, billions of dollars which had to be spent and it could not be done without planning. So you got the era of big science introduced, of course, now because of the film we all are seeing it, that because that this is the era of big science and then you have to plan even as capitalists, even as capital, you need to plan big science and that is where they take over Bernal and say, okay, we understand what the guy is saying. We need to do it too. The film you're referring to, of course, is Oppenheimer. Also a film which is less, in my opinion, about the nuclear bomb and more about the attack at the left. Um, turns out so many of them, including the sister of William Hinton, Joan Hinton worked as a communist in the uh, Manhattan Project. Probably this book, um, is an extraordinary book. And I know it's going to be uh, relished by lots of people. It requires a careful reading. It's very well written. I'm so proud that Leftward has produced it. I, I'd like to come back to you, Prabir, and do another conversation, more in-depth conversation about the role of the left and science, perhaps something like socialism and science. So let's consider this part one of a series of conversations we can have about this super stimulating book. Thanks a lot, Prabir. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for spending so much time on bringing the book out and Leftward, for, again, for a brilliant cover.